Welcome to World Affairs Today, brought to you by the World Affairs Council, Washington, D.C., a leading forum for global education and international affairs. My name is Stephanie Fassler, and I'm the International Affairs Program Director for the World Affairs Council, Washington, D.C. On behalf of, this of the Council, I welcome you to this Foreign Policy Panel Debate and World Affairs Today Program. Should Congress pass a resolution of disapproval of the Iran nuclear agreement? In July of 2015, the five permanent members of the UN Security Council and Germany, along with Iranian officials, signed the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action which, see, which seeks to regulate Iran's nuclear program. The agreement was the culmination of months of negotiations with the Secretary of State John Kerry and other officials and diplomats, and is seen as the long sought after historic agreement on an issue which has stalled for years. While the title of our program seems rather academic and maybe a bit bland, discussion around the topic has not been. Estimates between 20 to $50 million have been spent lobbying members of Congress prior to the August recess. Most of that has been by opponents of the deal. Our title deliberately reflects what Congress is actually facing a vote on. Not a yes or no vote of approval, but if a resolution of di dissolution should be passed at all. Tonight, we will seek to go beyond the sound bites of whether the deal is good or bad and explore the nuclear proliferation economic, and regional security implications and risks of this agreement. To debate this topic, we have two distinguished panelists. Daryl Kimball is the Executive Director at the Arms Control Association. Mr. Kimball has previously worked as the Executive Director of the Coalition to Reduce Nuclear Dangers and as the Director of the Security Programs at the Physicians for Social Responsibility. Mr. Kimball has spearheaded many campaigns for education against nuclear weapons and production. He has also helped advocate for the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. Michael Doran is a senior fellow at the Hudson Institute in Washington, D.C., specializing in Middle East security issues. During the George W. Bush administration, Mr. Doran was the senior director in the National Security Council on Middle East Issues. He has previously served as Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense and a senior advisor in the State Department on the Middle East. Finally, moderator of moderating our panel this evening is Anna Mulrine, the Defense Correspondent for Christian Science Monitor. Prior to working there, she was a senior editor at U.S. News & World Report magazine. Ms. Mulrine was also served as a Fulbright Fellow in Berlin, and her work has appeared in Rolling Stone, Men's Journal, and National Ge Geographic Traveler. She is regularly invited to appear on news outlets such as NPR, CBS, C-SPAN, and MSNBC. Please join me in welcoming our panel. Well, it's wonderful that we could all convene here tonight to discuss what is widely considered to be one of the most important foreign policy discussions since uh, the Iraq War uh, and the decision to invade in 2003, over a dozen years ago now. So, so it's good to be discussing it, and it might seem a bit anticlimactic at the moment because it does appear that uh, the president has the votes that he needs to um, to essentially uphold any veto that, uh, that he might issue should con Congress uh, decide to disapprove the, the resolution. But um, there are even enough votes to probably to filibuster and not to bring the measure to a vote at all. But uh, even so, it promises to be an exciting next few days. Um, and it's a debate that will continue to occupy the, um, you know, the public realm until September 17th when lawmakers have to vote on the resolution of disapproval. So Majority uh, Leader Mitch McConnell has asked that all senators be in their seats and present for, for the debate. Uh, today he asked, which is unusual since uh, most lawmakers generally speak to an empty room, and uh, McConnell says it's his goal to actually have a debate that rises to the occasion that this seems to require. So, so that's something. It's, uh, and, and it's important that we're here today to recapture um, all these thoughts for the historical record, um, which uh, you know we can look back and say where we went uh, 
where we might have gotten it wrong or where we might have actually gotten it right. And uh, maybe we can even you know, look back and have bipartisan hugs across the aisle and say, <laughs> uh, we really nailed it this time. So we can dare, dare dream on that. But uh, you know, equally important, tonight is about giving us a chance to learn about the deal. Sometimes in the midst of all this debate, you kind of enter it halfway through and you're trying to get your bearings and figure out you know, what, what are the main topics here? What are the, you know, the really important points to consider? So this is a chance to ask all those questions tonight. You know, we can kind of ask the basics. You can really, these are two wonderful uh, panelists who are, who are incredibly well informed. So, um, so it's just a nice chance to inform ourselves and ask what you want to ask. And, you know, don't be afraid to ask the simple questions. Sometimes those are the most important and, uh, and we can learn a lot from them. Um, but to give a brief overview of this, of this, uh, uh, you know, debate that we're having now. This deal comes after a standoff of about a dozen years, um, you know, two, including two de pretty yeah, big years of dense and highly technical discussions involving centrifuges and uranium stockpiles, and uh, you know, months of negotiations to get to this point. Uh, back in July, when what's known as the P5 plus one group of nations, which includes the U.S., the U.K., France, China, Russia, all security members, P5, and plus Germany, so extra one, announced that they'd reached this historic deal uh, with Iran to limit Tehran's nuclear activities in exchange for lifting what are generally agreed to be some of the toughest economic sanctions that the world community has ever put together, um, which essentially brought uh, Iran to its knees and, uh, and to the negotiating table. So um, these sanctions were, are scheduled to be lifted on what's known as implementation day, uh, which is going to be the day that Iran shows it has complied with specific obligations to reduce centrifuge numbers and uranium stockpiles. So, um, you know, this is expected to probably take six to nine months to do, and um, that, you know, means a big economic boost uh, brought by sanctions relief to Iran uh, would start in the first half of 2016. So, and at that point, that's the point where about $100 billion in Iranian assets would these are it's overseas assets that have been frozen, and they would immediately be unfrozen, and Iran's oil exports uh, would would skyrocket. So we'll hear from both sides of the debate tonight. But uh, the gist of it has opponents arguing something along the lines of, "Are you kidding me? We had Iran on its knees, um, and this agreement is the best we could do." You know, in essence, they're they're outraged that uh, the notion of the notion that Iran would be essentially let out of the international penalty box without having to terminate its nuclear program completely. So that's kind of one uh, side. Others say, listen, this is the best deal we could get from these guys. We had hundreds of scientists working on this. Um, we now have unprecedented access to their inspection points. And even if they stiff arm us and uh, you know, there are provisions that about, you know, access to military facilities that are still, uh, you know, um, a source of great contention, and, you know, Iran can kind of delay on those, but scientists say, listen, this material sticks around for ages, uh, you know, we can still, we can still, you know, essentially detect it if, if they were, uh, you know, if there were nefarious goings on. So, um, you know, we're essentially, you know, this is, this is the best we could do, and, and we're pleased with this. So that's kind of the other side of the debate. Um, you know, there are measures that would allow for what's known as snapping back these economic sanctions. This is a term we hear a lot, the snapback. Um, is there sufficient snapback? Uh, so you can ask about that during the Q&A period. Um, Clinton and Defense Secretary Ashton Carter, the president, they've all emphasized as well that should Iran pursue nuclear weapons, should we learn about this, um, that the U.S. has not taken military options off the table. So that's a bracing thought and one we can uh, explore here as well. So. Um, it's been a lively day in the news. We've had Trump and uh, Glenn Beck and Sarah Palin all converging on Capitol Hill for a rally today. Uh, Beck, for his part, has said that the president will be remembered as something far worse than Neville Chamberlain, which refers to the British prime minister who tried to appease Hitler. Uh, you know, uh, another talk show host, uh, far right, Mark Levin, has said, you know, Barack Obama has planted the seeds, in my view, for World War III. So much to discuss, and uh, and we'll start with our with our panelists, and we'll have about seven minutes on each side for them to kind of lay out their positions. Uh, should should Congress disapprove this resolution, and uh, then I'll ask a couple of questions, and then we'll turn it over to you guys to ask your questions. So we'll start. I will tell. Yeah. Thank you very much. I just put on my uh, timer, timer as well. 
Um, thank you all for coming. It's, um, my, I'm Mike Duran uh, from Hudson, uh, and it's my job to argue why Congress should disapprove the, uh, uh, the agreement. Uh, and I would just start by saying that uh, none of the claims that the President is making about the agreement, none of the major claims are true. Um, none of the major claims that he made in the past about what the agreement would become um, uh, have been true, and none of the claims about he's making about what it's going to be um, over time are true. Let me talk first a little bit about the past. Uh, he told us originally um, that he was going to dismantle Iran's nuclear infrastructure. Um, in fact, the deal is doing the opposite. It's industrializing uh, the, uh, the nuclear infrastructure over time. Um, he told us, for example, that he was going to close the Fordo site, the, uh, the underground bunker near Combe. Uh, it's not going to be closed. It's going to remain open. It's going to have centrifuges in it, and those centrifuges are going to be spinning. Uh, he promised us anytime, anywhere inspections. There are not going to be anytime, anywhere inspections. Those also evaporated. Uh, he told us during the negotiations when, when people said, why, are you, why aren't you talking about hostages? Why aren't you talking about Iranian support for terrorism or any of these other things? He said, no. These negotiations are strictly about the nuclear deal, nothing else. We shouldn't load it up with anything else. But at the last minute, the Iranians and the Russians put other issues into the mix. <coughs> they put the ballistics, ballistic missiles uh, into the mix, and they put uh, the conventional arms embargo into the mix, and we, caved on, uh, and we caved on both of those issues so that the restrictions on the uh, ballistic missiles will be lifted um, over time as well. Um, these are the cl these are some of the claims in the p that he made in the past about um, what what the what the agreement would look like when it finally materialized. Those are false, and also his claims about what the what the uh, agreement is going to become over time uh, are also false. He says it blocks all pathways to a bomb. It's simply not true. It doesn't do that. It actually provides Iran with um, a patient pathway to a bomb. That's if Iran. If Iran abides by the, uh, by the spirit and by the letter of the deal, uh, by year eight, thanks to the R&D loophole in the agreement, the, the, uh, the program will, uh, will uh, explode exponentially. It will become much, uh, it will become much bigger. By year, somewhere between year 10 and year 13, um, the breakout time, that's the, uh, the time it will take for Iran to amass enough fissile material to uh, construct a bomb. Um, will decrease to zero. That's according to the president himself uh, in one of his interviews with, um, uh, with NPR. It's not analysis by people like me. Um, and that's if Iran abides by the spirit and the letter um, of the agreement, um, something that I don't expect to see um, at all. Why? Because they've never, they've never stuck to any agreement that they've made in the past. Um, they've agreed. They've made. They've made. A, a, they, they have agreed in the past. They agreed with the Europeans to restrict their um, their program, and they uh, and they broke those agreements. I think we should expect them to to break this agreement. They don't agree that the United Nations and that we have any authority over them on on this matter. Um, it's simply a matter of the fact that we developed through the sanctions regime an enormous amount of leverage over them. Um, that we brought them to the table at all and that we got them to agree on paper um, to these things. Uh, but the, the problem here is that um, we are ceding leverage to Iran. Um, we started ceding leverage to Iran immediately when we signed the interim agreement in, uh, in November of 2013. Um, the president traded at that moment uh, uh, temporary uh, and easily reversible concessions by the Iranians for permanent and, and, and irreversible concessions by the United States. We had six Security Council resolutions um, uh, that said there should be zero reprocessing and zero enrichment by Iran. So Iran was in complete violation of international law uh, when we started these uh, negotiations. Um, and Iran was under enormous pressure financially due to the, uh, due to the economic sanctions that we had uh, Im imposed on them. And we immediately gave them sanctions relief up front. This is for the interim agreement, just so they would come to the table and negotiate with us. And we ripped up those six Security Council resolutions and said that by the end of this process, they will have, um, they will have a, an enrichment and reprocessing uh, program and uh, that there will be a sunset, that all restrictions on the program will eventually be, be lifted. Those are major concessions that we made up front before they, 
uh, before they gave us uh, uh, before they gave us anything. So from the very beginning, we have seeded leverage, and the deal as it progresses over time uh, seeds more and more leverage to them. Immediately, we're going to hand them between 100 and 150 billion dollars, uh, but we're also going to lift all of the restrictions on um, uh, uh, on commerce with them. So that we are building, by means of this deal, we are building an international economic lobby, including, uh, including some of our closest partners in Europe, against any kind of reimposition of the, um, of the sanctions. So what that means is the, the so-called snapback provision, whereby if the Iranians cheat, we snap back the, um, the, uh, uh, the uh, sanctions on them is basically meaningless because it means we, we then have to go to war with our, with our closest allies in order to, in order to reimpose the, the sanctions. So we have, created an, uh, we have created an incentive against snapping back, and we have created an international economic lobby in our closest democratic partners um, uh, that will be opposed to any kind of, uh, uh, to any kind of snapback. So what actually is going to happen is the snapback provision is going to have the exact reverse effect um, uh, of the one that the president is claiming, and that is that the, the Iranians will be able to claim um, that if we impose more sanctions on them, that they will leave the, the that they will leave the deal, and we will find ourselves in exactly the same position we're in now, with them on a, uh, the threshold of a nuclear uh, weapon. But we will not have any of the any of the tools that we have had up until now for uh, for influencing them and constricting their uh, uh, and constricting their their behavior. Um, so uh, we cede leverage to them, uh, and uh, I guess we need to ask, why has the president agreed to such a lopsided deal uh, to begin with, and why has he nego negotiated so poorly? A lot of people on my side of the aisle are saying that he was hoodwinked, uh, that the Iranians are really fantastic negotiators and we were tricked. It's simply not true. Um, the fact of the matter is the president wants Iran as a partner in the Middle East to stabilize the Middle East. And the nuclear deal is the thing that stands in the way of that, um, uh, of that partnership. So what he's doing by means of the deal is he's parking the nuclear thing off to one side for uh, hopefully for 10 years so we can get down to the serious business of working with Iran to stabilize the, the, the Middle East. Um, and this is, the, the, in my mind, it's the worst aspect of the deal, which is the strategic concept behind it that we can actually work with Iran against ISIS and other, uh, um, and other actors in the region. We're going to find ourselves very quickly with an empowered Iran, uh, empowered economically, empowered militarily. It's going to have a new revitalized, uh, it's going to have revitalized um, military relations with, uh, um, with some of our worst adversaries in the region, uh, in, in the world. Um, and it's going to have uh, a greater diplomatic power. And it's going to use all of that power for all of the purposes that it has used it for the last 30 years. And we're going to find ourselves in conflict with them again. And we're going to be in a worse position than we would have been had we never signed this agreement to begin with. Thank you. All right. Well, I'm Daryl Kimball. I'm director of the Arms Control Association. Glad to see you all here this evening uh, to investigate this really important topic, uh, which uh, I have been, my organization has been looking at for several years, uh, quite intensively over the last three or four. Um, in our view, uh, this agreement, the Joint Conference Plan of Action, is in the U.S. national security interest. It's in the international security interest. Uh, it uh, will do what it uh, says it will do. And I'm going to explain why uh, it has uh, so much support uh, from former members of Congress, a growing number of national security leaders, including uh, former Secretary of State Colin Powell, uh, former National Security Advisor Brent Scowcroft, many others, the vast majority of nuclear nonproliferation experts, retired generals, admirals, top scientific leaders, etc., uh, the UN Security Council, um, and the many members of Congress who uh, actually did take uh, the chance to look at this very complex 159 page document. Uh, and when they did, they found that. Uh, this is an effectively verifiable agreement that is going to reverse Iran's nuclear progress uh, and stop it well short of nuclear weapons for more than a generation. Uh, and they also see, uh, and the other reason why this, uh, this, the Congress should support the deal, is that the rejection of this agreement, or blocking its implementation uh, in the months and years ahead, would transform a historic diplomatic breakthrough into a geostrategic disaster. We had to, I got to begin by explaining that and, and, and reminding everybody that prior to 
2013, Iran's capacity to produce nuclear bomb material was growing. And Iran had that capacity since about 2006. As Colin Powell put it the other day, Iran was on a super highway to being able to amass enough material for uh, a nuclear weapon without any serious speed bumps until the interim agreement uh, halted Iran's progress in 2013 and allowed the time to negotiate this comprehensive agreement. Be uh, between 2006 and 2009, Iran had, just to give you one statistic, zero centrifuges in 2006. It was operating about 5,000 by 2009. Between 2009 and 2013, it increased the number from 5,000 to almost 20,000. Uh, that put it within a couple to three months of amassing 25 kilograms of highly enriched uranium, enough uh, to, to make one nuclear weapon if it could be weaponized and fashioned into a device. So uh, with this agreement, uh, Iran's progress is uh, halted, it's reversed, and it's kept in a box for uh, 15 years or longer. And let me explain why. The agreement is going to force the Iranians to verifiably remove two-thirds of its installed centrifuges. They will only have, uh, for a period of uh, 10 years, uh, 5,060 operating first-generation centrifuges. Uh, that means that they are not going to be capable of producing enough material for one nuclear bomb in any uh, less than 12 months um, for at least a decade. That breakout timeline is also due to the fact that their low enriched uranium stockpile, which is now around 8,000 kilograms, has to be shrunk down to 300 kilograms for 15 years. These are the, the core restrictions that are going to walk back its capacity. Other things include uh, the fact that the Iraq heavy water reactor, uh, which my organization helped blow the whistle on in 2005-2006, uh, which can produce, if, the design, if as designed, it is built uh, up to two nuclear bombs worth of plutonium each year. That reactor is going to be redesigned. Cement is going to fill the, uh, the old core uh, so that this reactor cannot, will not uh, be able to produce plutonium for nuclear weapons. So the plutonium pathway, in addition to the uranium pathway, is blocked off. Uh, Michael didn't talk about the, the importance of more effective monitoring uh, by the International Atomic Energy Agency, which supplements our own national intelligence capabilities. Uh, Iran today has a comprehensive safeguards agreement, which allows the IAEA to inspect the declared facilities. But what about the undeclared facilities? That's where the real danger is. Uh, and what this agreement allows is, or requires, is that Iran agree to something called the Additional Protocol, which does give the IAEA anytime, anywhere access to any site that it suspects or has information from U.S. intelligence or other intelligence agencies may be involved in a non-compliant activity. Iran has, uh, they have to give Iran two hours notice to get into that facility. Uh, there is a process spelled out in this agreement that allows for no more than 24 days of um, back and forth between Iran and the IAEA and the P5 plus one. If after 24 days Iran is still denying access to a particular site, uh, the provisions that are in uh, UN Security Council Resolution 2231, that's the new one that was just adopted, allow the, uh, any one of the P5 plus one, just one country, to snap back sanctions. That is a really tough hammer that is going to help compel the Iranians to cooperate with the, the IAEA's future efforts. This agreement also requires Iran to finally clarify what in the heck it was doing, and we all think we know what they were doing, a decade ago with experiments related to nuclear weapons development. Uh, the Iranians are not going to get sanctions relief unless they provide the IAEA with the information it needs to resolve this investigation that's been going on for a decade. Uh, that has to be done by December 15th. So Iran is going to have to do four big things in order to get UN Security Council sanctions relief in the next half a year to a year. One is they're going to have to remove two-thirds of this operating their installed centrifuges. Uh, they're going to have to shut down the Fordo underground facility, uh, take out all the centrifuges that were involved with uranium enrichment. It's going to be converted to a medical isotope uh, facility. Uh, the Iraq reactor is going to have to be uh, converted. The core is going to have to be destroyed. 
uh, and the IAEA is going to have to be given the access under the additional protocol and other provisions that require Iran to provide much earlier notification. If Iran violates the agreements, I mean, Michael says the snapback provisions aren't worth uh, the paper they're written on. This is an unprecedented arrangement that many people are shocked the Iranians agreed to. What does it mean? It means that if any one of the P5 plus one believe that Iran is violating the terms of the JCPOA, the Iran deal, they can call for the Security Council to consider a resolution that continues to suspend the six previous uh, rounds of sanctions that the UN passed. That country can then veto the, the resolution that continues the suspension. In other words, all those previous sanctions snap back into place. Now let's make one thing clear. Um, sanctions alone have not and will not prevent a determined Iran from pursuing nuclear weapons if they really want to do so. Uh, it's a deterrent. It has changed their calculations at the negotiating table. But sanctions alone are not going to stop the determined mm -hmm. country. So, but this is a very important uh, deterrent that is going to last uh, for uh, 15 years, uh, by which time Iran's program is going to be severely scaled back. Beyond that, there are questions. Uh, there is work that's going to have to be done in order to ensure that Iran does not quickly expand its uranium enrichment capacity. But the key point that everybody needs to remember is that if this deal is rejected, uh, if the United States walks away, we're walking away alone. The limits on Iran's program under the interim deal, which many people said was uh, a, the major disaster, but then they later came to embrace it, the restrictions that are promised by this deal all disappear. The sanctions regime is going to melt away. U.S. leverage is going to decrease if we want to go back to the negotiating table. And by the way, I've talked to, to Iranian negotiators. I cannot imagine they're going to want to go back to the negotiating table and renegotiate something that is on better terms with the United States uh, for Senator Tom Cotton or somebody like that. So the alternative to this very effective deal is no deal and a nuclear-armed Iran and a much more dangerous future because I agree with Michael. Iran is a dangerous country, and with nuclear weapons, it's a much more dangerous country. And the responsible thing to do is to remove the nuclear uh, weapon from Iran's foreign policy equation. Thank you. All right, now I'll start with a couple of questions, and then we'll turn it over to you guys. So, so Michael, if, if lawmakers, uh, some of the Democratic lawmakers, hear your plea and uh, decide, you know what, we've listened to Michael, we're going to we're going to scrap this thing. We're uh, we're going to vote to uh, disapprove this this uh, this measure. Then, you know, um, the Republicans have been accused of being obstructionist without without any solutions. So, if we're looking looking at solutions, you know, what do you see as uh, as a better alternative? What would you suggest? You know, what did this deal not do that you think plausibly it could have? And then Daryl, I'll ask you to respond. Um, thanks. Well, um, what we needed to do, what we needed was a deal that would have pro that would have uh, achieved what President Obama said this deal would achieve when he first uh, went down the path of negotiating with the Iranians, and that is dismantling uh, their nuclear infrastructure. Um, now, um, I point out that uh, I think there's a fundamental contradiction in what Daryl told us. Uh, I, I, we have to get the fact that I actually disagree with most of what he said, and I'd like to explain why. But let me just talk about the fundamental contradiction. Um, Daryl says that if we if we scrap the deal now, the coalition falls apart, the sanctions are no good, we can't reimpose the sanctions. Yet he's also saying, and the administration is saying, that at some later point, after Iran has started to do business with Germany and with Britain and with Russia and with China, and he has they have a military relationship with China and a military relationship with uh, um, with Russia, that if we snap back the sanctions, then well, then it will work. Then we will put enormous pressure on, uh, uh, on, on Iran, and we will be able to coerce them to do whatever we want. And there's a fundamental contradiction here. Either snapping back sanctions works or it doesn't work. It's not going to not work now and then suddenly, uh, suddenly work later. And why is it going to work better later when they, have this, uh, when they have all these international trading partners and their international power has increased, uh, uh, has increased enormously? I mean, this is, a, this is a fundamental contradiction, and the, the administration wants to, have it, uh, wants to have it both ways. I say we do have coercive power, we have significant coercive power, um, and we have to combine our economic power with our military power. The president went on 
Israeli television, and he said, there is no military option. The, now, he wants, he wants us to believe something that is simply not true. He wants us to believe that we can, we can claw away from the Islamic Republic of Iran, its nuclear program, by being nice to them and giving them sanctions relief and, re and removing all of, the re all, all of the restrictions on them. It's simply not true. If we don't want them to have a nuclear weapon, we have to coerce them into giving up their nuclear program. That's just a fact of life. It's right. And there are two forms of coercion. There's economic coercion and military coercion. There has to be a credible military threat combined with economic coercion. If we don't have that, we will not get what we want. Yeah. Well, first of all, about snapback, I mean, you're, you misrepresented what I said. So just to take a moment, we should be careful to be clear about what another is saying and not to recharacterize it. I said that the United States or France, if they think Iran is going to, has violated the agreement, they can move to snap back sanctions. I didn't say snapping back sanctions would work in stopping a determined Iran from getting nuclear weapons. I said the sanctions will snap back. And I also said, and I think you would agree, that sanctions alone have not stopped Iran's nuclear progress and cannot by themselves stop Iran's nuclear progress. They are a tool. So you've okay, admitted so that, that it's an ineffective tool. I didn't say it was ineffective. I said it is a tool that has limited value. So that's what I said. Okay. So it's so let me no good as a coercive measure. That's that's your assessment. Okay. But let me just try to go back to the question that you asked, right? Which is, is there a better alternative? And I didn't hear an answer to the question aside from uh, we need to pound the president needs to pound his fist harder on the table about the possibility of military force being used in order to, I guess bomb Iran's nuclear facilities. Uh, at this point, we have to do that by ourselves, okay, because the P5 have just approved uh, this agreement. I don't think we'll get the rest of the Security Council to go along. Uh, we have enough problems in the region. Uh, there may be other places we want to put our, our uh, military resources other than this. The other thing I didn't hear is what would we want to achieve uh, in another negotiation, let's assume we could get to another negotiation, which I think is complete fantasy. What Barack Obama said, uh, and what the UN Security Council's resolutions demanded was that Iran must halt its uranium enrichment program and halt its activities to build the Iraq reactor so that there could be a negotiated resolution, long-term resolution to this deal. That's what the resolution said. They did not say Iran can never ever enrich uranium for peaceful purposes. They did not say you cannot have a peaceful program. They did not say Iran must dismantle its entire nuclear infrastructure. So let's be clear about what the resolution said and what Barack Obama said and what the goal has been, which has, by the way, been the goal of the late Bush administration and the Barack Obama administration. And that is what we basically have in this, this agreement. So I think if we're going to you know, argue that there is a better alternative, it, it really needs to meet the, the reality test of can we get there under the current circumstances? And uh, is this something that is worth achieving um, given that we have this, this deal in hand? And Michael, would you like to respond to that? I mean, are there some concrete measures that you would like to see in play other than, you know, a little more robust uh, threatening of use of military force? Well, what I'd would like be to, helpful? I'd like to see a return to the sanctions. Um, I would like to see us use our, um, our sanctions, particularly the sanctions against the Central Bank of Iran. Um, the, the president unilaterally dismantled the sanctions regime. He's presenting it to us. He's, what he's presenting to us is a completely false story. The, the story is that the international community forced him to give, up these, uh, um, to give up these sanctions. That's not what happened. We opened a secret channel to Tehran without telling any of our partners, whether our, even, even our closest European partners, and certainly not our Middle Eastern partners, that we were opening up this channel. In that channel, we agreed secretly, bilaterally, to, um, uh, to rip up six Security Council resolutions and to begin giving them sanctions relief. Now, um, I talked recently with um, some French parliamentarians who, until recently, were very hard line, they were very hard line on the Iranian nuclear program. And uh, uh, they said to us, uh, you played us for suckers, basically. Because now we are in a position, if we, if we France, take a harder line than the United States on, on the nuclear deal, which we think is horrendous, if we take a harder line, then we, are, uh, then we have angered the United States, the most powerful country in the world, 
and we put ourselves at the back of the line for contracts with the, uh, uh, with the Iranians. Um, and so we have no choice in order to preserve our good relations with the United States. We have no choice but to go along with this deal and to, uh, and to get the best of it that we can, which is good economic relations with the, um, with the Iranians. Neither the Germans, nor the French, nor the British are making decisions on the basis of this issue with respect to the, uh, um, uh, to the hard security uh, implications of the deal in the Middle East. All the people, all the people who actually feel the military pressure from the Iranians, that's, the, that's the, our Gulf Arab allies, the Israelis, and everyone else in the region, they hate this deal, they think it's horrendous, they think it strengthens Iran, and they would like to see it ripped up. If you talk to our partners quietly, the French and the British, behind the scenes, they will also admit that this deal is, not, this deal is going to strengthen Iran, and it isn't good from a security point of view. But they have been given no alternative by this unilateral decision by the United States. I'm, I'm sorry, but that's just completely, utterly false, uh, Mike. I mean, the, the, the B5, the EU3, okay, are very proud of this achievement. They will uh, tell you publicly and privately that this diplomatic outcome is the result of European diplomacy that has been in motion for some 15 years. What, what happened in Oman? Okay. What, Gulf, what, what happened in Oman? Let me, let me finish my, my thought, okay? And I won't interrupt you. Uh, they, they very strongly think that this is an accomplishment of theirs, okay? They brought the United States along, okay? It's and, not true. Okay. Well, we can, we can go ask uh, Ambassador Aro or some of the others to, uh, to clarify this. And he was involved in this for, for many years. And I've sat down, I've spoken with him, and had dinner with him about this. Uh, the Gulf allies today have publicly expressed their support for this agreement. Our Gulf allies are uncomfortable about Iran, as they should be, but they are uh, expressing publicly their support for the JCPOA. So, you know, we can have our, our different uh, versions of history here and, and, and the record, but I mean, I, I defy you to tell me exactly where you're getting this idea that the United States went behind the back of the, the EU3 to pursue a strategy that they today do not support. First of all, okay, this, well, is, first like this to, is the fact. I'd like to just raise this is another. The fact that that's what happened. I'd like to raise another topic that you both brought up, and I think it's it's a pretty it's a pretty common uh, you know question I've, among a lot of people, and it and involves military force as well, and and that's kind of the you know the thing that we're always threatening to do if if this if uh, Iran strays, you know we've not taken military force off the table. That's kind of a, a common refrain. You know, the logical conclusion of that is, uh, you know, listen, we can we can launch a military strike. Uh, Defense Secretary Ashton Carter, uh, as the one responsible for launching these military strikes, said that these strikes would be effective in setting back Iran's nuclear program, but they would also do so with serious second and third order repercussions. Um, Carter's also said that the long-term outcome that we'd have under this uh, mm -hmm. nuclear deal is more durable than one that a military strike would bring about. You know, can we agree on the inadvisability of military strikes? What's your sense of this? Can we discuss some of the second and third order effects that that military force would involve? Because I think, you know, that's it's a view of a lot of people who say, why don't we just why don't we just get in there? We've got a strong military, we put billions of dollars into our military, why don't we just bomb them? Um, well uh, first of all I'm not advocating that. Um, what I'm saying is that Iran is a weak country in comparison to the United States. First of all, I'm saying the United States is a very powerful and influential country. People don't like to be on the wrong, our allies don't like to be on the wrong side of the United States. So when the President of the United States announces a national security priority, and when he shows you that if you, if you defy him on this issue, that he will bring the full brunt of his, uh, all of his power to bear against you, you think twice about doing it. That's what's happened with our allies. Um, the, uh, uh, the same is true of the Iranians. The Iranians don't want war with the United States. Um, the Iranians do not believe there will be war with the United States if they defy it. Nobody in the Middle East believes that, and they haven't believed it since the, President Obama announced his red line in Syria and then backed away from it. Uh, so they're, they're, the President, uh, for a long time, used the refrain that all options were on the table, but his body language said something else, and everybody read it, I think, very clearly. And as I mentioned on Israeli TV, he actually went on and said there is no military option. Nobody believes that Barack Obama is going to attack the Iranians between now and the time that, uh, uh, and the time that he leaves. 
for our for our diplomacy and our economic power to be successful, it needs to be backed up by a credible military threat. And that's what I'm saying. If we have if if we showed that we had a uh, it was a national security priority to make Iran dismantle um, uh, to dismantle its program, and that if it continued on the superhighway toward the bomb, it would face catastrophic consequences, then I think we could change their calculus. And Michael, you said that you would not advise, uh, you know, you said you're not, you're not arguing that we should, that we should strike Iran. Why not? Because, because I think that, uh, I think that war is a very serious business and it does have second and third order effects. But I'm, I'm also saying that if it, if, if, if preventing them from getting a nuclear weapons capability is indeed a U.S. national security priority, a vital interest, as, uh, as several U.S. presidents have said, Right then, it, we have to back it up by a credible military threat. Well, I'm glad we agree that uh, military strike in Iran's facilities is not not uh, the route to pursue right now, um, because I mean I agree with Ash Carter, that's Defense Secretary Carter. Uh, those strikes, while they could be extremely effective given U.S. military capabilities, are going to at best delay Iran's program by three, four years, and have wider effects in, in the region. Uh, this agreement, uh, by I think all reasonable measures, puts back Iran's program by 12 to 15 years, and I would argue uh, even more, but at least 12 to 15 years, uh, where they're in, in the box. So um, the other thing I would just say, in addition to this, and it's an important thing to consider, is that all of the options that we have today, diplomatic, economic, uh, military, are still out there in the future if Iran veers from uh, the JCPOA, the Iran deal, or if they uh, try after year 15, let's say, to dramatically increase the number of centrifuges they have deployed and to increase the enrichment levels, et cetera, et cetera, making it clear that they're moving towards the bomb. All of our options are still available. And we are going to be, if that's what happens, in a far better position at that point with the support of the international community, with the JCPOA uh, in, in, in the past uh, to justify uh, U.S. and allied action against Iran. So we're going to be in a far better position than if we abandon this agreement today and, and hope that there's still that option at some point uh, in the future, which would not be effective. You have to let me answer that because it, it's, simply, okay. it's simply not true. It's simply not true, and you just need to think what about is, it. What it is simply not true. That we will be everything in a better. That we will. Everything you said, yes, but uh, oh, but in you. particular the in particular the last thing that you said, that we will be in a far better position, and that the the president, uh, a future president, will have all the same options, uh, ten years from now, five years from now, that the president has now. It's not true, because the president, President Obama's agreement is dismantling, is dismantling the sanctions regime. Um, that we have in place, which gave us uh, enormous leverage. Iran is going to get stronger. They're going to get stronger immediately. They're already getting stronger right in front of our face as we watch this. Um, the Russians are, have developed a military-to-military -military relationship with the, Rus with the Iranians already, uh, and that's going to increase. The Russians are now uh, working together with the Iranians on the ground in, uh, in Syria. We're about to deliver $150 billion oh, uh, within the next um, 8 to 10 months. Or is it 50? Where, where do you get your 150 from? From President Obama. The 150, the, the hundred, Treasury Secretary pre says it's President. 50 to the, the 150 billion. billion dollar figure was stated by President Obama in an interview. Now they're trying to say it's going to be less. Oh, let's say it's 50 billion. Okay. It's 50 billion. It's 75 billion. Whatever, however many billions it is, it's billions. Are it's they going to spend it all on weapons for Hezbollah, or the, or the, not? the point is How that they, know? the point is that they are going to become much more powerful. They're going to become much more powerful economically, diplomatically, and militarily. And that power is going to grow exponentially because we're going to have new economic relations with them and it's going to, it's going to become cumulative over time. One of the great values of the, of the sanctions regime was the cumulative effect. What we've done, this is, the, this, is the, this is the diplomatic equivalent of taking your money out of your retirement account um, and, and paying taxes on it and, and, and Can starting I make to three, spend it. Three quick points, and I know there are other questions. Yeah. Okay, but first of all, we've got to remember that uh, yes, there are unfrozen, there are assets going to be unfrozen that Iran has, has, has accumulated, okay? It's closer to 50 to 59 billion according to the Treasury Department, okay? That's Today. 
Okay, today. A, um, a month ago, President okay. Obama said but 150 if, billion. if, Michael, okay, you're going to argue that we should not go forward with this nuclear agreement that holds back the nuclear progress because we're worried that uh, they're going to get their hands on their own money that we're needing. What you're basically saying is that we should never have had a deal on the nuclear issue. That's what you're saying. Because the purpose of the sanctions, I might I remind you, was to bring Iran to the table, to increase the leverage of the P5 plus one at the negotiating table. And the whole point of the whole uh, structure of this was to uh, provide sanctions relief in a metered way, and it is being metered, uh, when Iran fulfills key obligations that hold it back from a nuclear weapons capability. That's what's happening. So if you're unhappy that Iran is getting these unfrozen assets, what you're basically in saying that they shouldn't get them, and that's enough of a reason to block, we should never have gone down the road of negotiating with them on the nuclear issue. Well, what I'm saying, what I'm saying is that we should have gotten a much better deal for it. We, we had enormous leverage, which we handed over in return for very little. That's what I'm saying. Okay. Okay. So we have a lot to, uh, to discuss, and now is the time where you guys can ask your questions. I, I find myself in a very str strange position because as a person who spent most of my career working for Democratic congressmen and senators, I am a ferocious critic of this deal, which I find incomprehensible. So recently, as you know, a month or so ago, the president uh, went to American University sort of channeling President Kennedy's speech on nuclear nonproliferation. And that's what concerns me most about this today. Um, there is a well-publicized list. You've all seen all the countries that are lining up in the Arab world and the regional uh, 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 countries mm -hmm. lining up to get and develop nuclear weapons of their own. Uh, it would be shorter to list uh, escalators not working in the metro than, than to list all those countries. Um, but, but the reality is that, uh, that you're dealing with countries that are going to have four to 12 minutes flying time uh, for a missile. Nobody's going to have secure second strike capabilities. No one's going to have secure command and control. I think that this is, uh, this is uh, uh, doing the exact opposite of nonproliferation, and that if this deal goes through, there will almost certainly be a war, whether or not we're part of it, whether or not Israel's part of it, who knows? And sir, I'm going to have to ask you to yep. start a That's okay. the question. No, no, that, that was my question. Uh, is is this in indeed the slippery slope that leads us to increased nuclear risk? Yeah, did you well, well, just a quick question back to you. I mean, what what is your list of countries who are ready to get the bomb and send it in four to twelve minutes on a ballistic missile? The countries that have talked about uh, 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 the United Arab Emirates, uh, Jordan, uh, Egypt, uh, uh, Saudi Arabia. All right, I have to dispute your list. Okay, because Saudi Arabia. Well, these are listed in the New York Times and other. I mean, they're. Okay, they're, this is my profession. All right. Okay. Okay. I'm just telling you, I have not seen an Egyptian government official say they're interested in pursuing nuclear weapons. I have not seen a Jordanian official. Okay. UAE. Okay. The UAE is part of the Nuclear Nonproliferation Disarmament Initiative. Okay. They forswore ever uh, the enrichment of, of uranium. Saudi Arabia is a problem because it is a major. Uh, rival of Iran, um, and it is concerned about Iran getting nuclear weapons capability. So in the future, we have to deal with the, the problem of Saudi Arabia in particular. I would agree. So how do we do that, and are we in a better position uh, with this deal in place or without it? And I would say, to repeat myself from earlier, we're in a far better position to persuade Saudi Arabia that it should not and need not match Iran's enrichment program or otherwise try to develop its own nuclear weapons capability with this deal in place. Uh, will there be a problem 15, 20, 25 years from now? There may well be, okay, but uh, we've got some time to work on that. And one of the things we're going to be working on is making sure that Saudi Arabia uh, it itself is not getting access to these technologies. It is not true that Saudi Arabia can you know, go on the internet and dial up from the former AQ Khan network a Pakistani nuclear bomb. It takes a lot of work for a country to develop the nuclear infrastructure necessary to make nuclear weapons. So we have, uh, I said it's not possible to dial it up on the internet, okay? As some people but it is think. possible to buy a bomb. To buy a bomb? Yeah. Okay, from where? From Pakistan. I would disagree with that too. 
So we have we have proliferation challenges to deal with. Okay, I think we're better off with this agreement in place because Iran is not going to be uh, operating 20,000 centrifuges in the year 2017. They're going to be operating uh, 5,000 at most. Okay. Well, Pakistan I, uh, began with 3,000. Na naturally, I. Uh, uh, I of course disagree with all this, uh, and I, I thank you for uh, uh, I thank you for raising the issue. It's something that I should have mentioned uh, uh, earlier. I think the proliferation risk is huge. Um, I don't. I do think that by even if the deal uh, goes through its full lifespan, which as I said I, I don't expect, um, but even if it does, then we know that by that by year ten, maybe year thirteen, um, uh, Iran is going to have. Uh, it's going to be at uh, zero breakout time, um, and it is going to have almost no restrictions on it whatsoever. It's going to be strengthened enormously, and it's going to be out from under the Security Council and everything else. Um, so, if you're a if you're a Saudi planner and you're concerned about this, you don't wait till year ten um, until you start doing something about it. You start working on it. Um, you start working on it now. Now, back in 2012. Um, when the first priority of the Obama administration was to dissuade the Israelis um, from attacking uh, Iran, its line at that time was, uh, don't worry, we, uh, keeping Iran from getting a nuclear uh, weapons capability is my number one national security priority. Why? Because I'm, I'm concerned about the proliferation risk. It's a no-brainer, um, and, and there's a tremendous risk that Saudi Arabia will get a bomb from Pakistan. That was the line um, at the time. Once the interim agreement was signed and we saw that they were handing the, um, uh, that they were handing the Iranians a, uh, uh, an enrichment capability as, uh, as part of that, the line switched and the, uh, at that point then the, the risk of Saudi proliferation was much less than anybody had been saying, uh, uh, had been saying prior to that. Um, I tend to believe what Obama, the Obama administration 1.0 was saying in 2012 rather than what the Obama administration is saying, um, uh, is saying today. And I say that just because of what I see in the region. The, the, everyone in the region, like I say, sees Iran getting stronger in every dimension of, uh, of its power. And they see the United States no longer willing to contain Iran. Uh, they don't trust the United States with their security anymore. That's the, that is the, that's the single most important thing here, is that we have lost credibility as a guarantor of their security. And they're going to search for other ways, not just to match the capabilities of Iran, but to gain leverage over us to make sure that we respect their, uh, their interests, much in the way that the French went and developed their own um, nuclear capability in order to have influence over our, uh, in order to gain influence over their own allies. That's, so, I, so I think we have created an enormous incentive on a number of levels uh, for the Saudis and for others to, to do this. We've had a rocky history with Iran. And in, in, uh, after 9-11, there were a million Iranians out having candlelight vigils for us. Then they helped us with intelligence with al-Qaeda. And as they say, Bush rewarded them by calling them the axis of evil and threatening them. And they made a peace offering to us in 2003, which Bush ignored. So. We uh, missing opportunities, and you said that this you're not anyway. I, I'm interested in um, cycles of escalation and de-escalation of cycles of violence and coercion and tr transformation. And I think you know there's a very sort of concrete black and white view of Iran, whereas it, it's more dynamic. And um, seeing this deal as a potential for moderation, it seems so far that it's having a it could have a moderating effect. You say that it's making them stronger, but um, you know, the leadership, there's 60% of the population is under 35, and they want Facebook and Twitter, and they want so, to engage so, with the West. So and you're trying to ask, could this, could this help transform well, the relationship? Well, I'm saying, it, I mean, there's lots of evidence. Yes, yeah, yeah. talk about potential have, for moderation, have depending have on how we, and a beginning and an opening, right. and if we treat okay. with respect. There's a strong possibility that the Obama administration believes that. Um, ben Rhodes, the Deputy National Security Advisor for Strategic Communications, said that we believe that an Iran with this deal will be uh, will will, uh, uh, will be a, a better actor. I can't remember the exact words than um, than without. Um, I personally don't see it that way. I totally agree with you that Iran is a complex country. Um, it's a sophisticated country, and that uh, and 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 that its politics are um, can be rather nuanced in many ways, and that the population 
um, in Iran is, but first of all, that it's not like Saddam's Iraq and it's the poorest country. People travel and they go back and forth and there's a lot of sympathy for the United States in the population mm -hmm. writ large. I totally agree with that. And I also agree that under the right circumstances, the right diplomacy by the United States could use that tension between the regime and the population to our advantage. Um, it, it's my view that we're not, we're not doing that because we're actually strengthening the most malign actors in the, in the system with this, um, uh, with this deal. We're making a deal with the hardliners, not with the, uh, uh, not with the moderates. Um, and, and, and that's true. That's true in Iran itself, and it's true throughout the the the, uh, the whole region. Like I said, you know, for instance, with us indirectly coordinating with the militias that are run by Qasem Soleimani. Qasem Soleimani, the head of the Quds Force, is the sanctions on him uh, through the Security Council have been lifted by this deal. Right, well, but his popularity is down, well and well Rouhani and Zarif right? popularity is up now. Well, yeah. I said his popularity is down, and Rouhani and Zarif, their popularity is going up. Now. But it's not a, it's not a, it's it's not a, it's not a democracy, right? It's a, it's a dictatorship, and we've given the regime a new lease on life. I this is this is my view. The the regime, I think, has very carefully created um, a, an economic infrastructure. The Revolutionary Guards own uh, a significant amount of the economy, and, and and specifically those elements of the economy that are going to benefit the most directly and immediately from the um, from the deal. So I, I think we've uh, if the regime was on the ropes in 2009, I think we have given them a lifeline. Daryl, final word. Well, you know, Michael has argued that one of the reasons why this deal has been pursued by the Obama administration is in the hope that there can be this broader rapprochement, and that is the rationale for this. I have spoken with Ben Rhodes, uh, with uh, the Vice President's National Security Advisor very recently, with others at the State Department about this. The purpose of this joint comprehensive plan of action on Iran's nuclear program is to deal with the nuclear threat uh, that Iran's nuclear program posed. Um, there may be, and I hope, but I'm not expecting, and it's not the basis for this agreement, uh, that there are some positive side effects, but the administration has pursued this because of the severe nature of the nuclear threat. Um, and and uh, they will say uh, that uh, if uh, this agreement, and I think they're correct, if this agreement is rejected by the United States, if, if we walk away at some point in the future, that is going to hurt those who negotiated this agreement with the United States. Uh, the pragmatists, and there is some diversity within Iran, and there are some factions. It is going to hurt Rouhani, Zarif, and is going to give rise uh, greater strength to uh, the IRGC, the hardliners, uh, and the Supreme Leader is going to uh, kind of blow with the, the political winds, and there are political winds inside Tehran, and it's going to go in that direction. So if there is to be some moderation in Iran, uh, in Iranian policy in the next few years, um, uh, you know, this deal may help facilitate that, but that's not what I'm, I'm banking on. Uh, and if this deal is rejected, uh, I think we can be quite sure that we will see um, uh, a hardening of Iran's position in, in the years to come. I think that'll do it for tonight. Thank you.